1, 2 Timothy, and chapter 1. Teens, I have a nice King James Version. Uh, Hendrickson's Hendrickson Bible is the uh, publishing company that uh, assembled it, but it's a stitched stitched uh, binding. It's a probably medium, I'd say medium grade Bible. In other words, it's not a glued binding. It's actually stitched, genuine imitation leather uh, cover, and this is going to be a prize for a teenager. So. Hang out, hang around. One day, it'll surprise you, but somebody's going to get this Bible, uh, some teenager. So, let uh, make sure that you get the word out that this Bible is available, and it's not going to be sold. It's going to be given out as a prize for teenagers. So, I haven't figured out exactly how that's going to work, but you may be noticing it. It uh, has been floating around. By the way, if you don't have a uh, good quality copy of the Scripture, can I recommend to you a local church ministry called Local Church Bible Publishers? And they are a premier quality uh, printing company. And the, the Bibles that they print, how many of y'all have one of these? Brother Mark has one, Mrs. Price has one. Uh, this, uh, Charlie has one. Is that one of you? I, it's, I think Baron Press's C, I think they make them for that one. But they, this is a church in Michigan that really got burdened about the matter of secular companies holding copyrights and profiting from printing and translating the scripture. Why would you have people that are non-believers involved with uh, the printing and the preservation process of the scripture? Something we ought to really think heavily about. And so a church really <laughs> kind of took, just took the responsibility seriously and started printing Bibles. And these are leather bound. Uh, you just can't get a better quality printed Bible than one of these. They're leather bound. And like this one's ironed calfskin. And it's just really, really well made. I rough mine up and throw them around. And uh, the pages, I, I'm a Bible thumper. I thump people with my Bible <laughs> and use it for a lot of things. But they're very, very good quality. It's local church Bible publishers, a ministry, just a church ministry in Michigan. They, they um, assemble and print and uh, go through the whole process of, of uh, making Bibles and make them available to people at cost. So what it costs them. If this were a Cambridge, this would be nearly a $300 Bible, and I think it's something like $60 uh, from local church Bible publisher. I mean, it's just what it costs them in materials. Now, you, if you're on the website and you want to support that ministry, and by the way, I think that's a great ministry support, you can donate to them, but you can buy this Bible for shipping plus whatever the actual cost is, and it's a fantastic deal. And sometimes I mention things like that. I'm not a salesman, and obviously I'm not trying to sell you anything that I could profit by. Uh, but you can profit by having a good copy of the scripture. So I want to let you know about that just in case you don't have that information. Many times I've mentioned that somebody's come to me afterward and asked me to order them a Bible or whatever. And so if you need one, uh, let me know and I can, I can help you with the process of getting one of those. Okay, 2 Timothy chapter 1. And please look down to verse 14. And this will just kind of tie into where we were last, last Sunday evening. And then we'll move right along. By the way, do we have a baptism today? Was that last week? Last week? Okay. Man, I, I thought it was last week, but I'm telling you something. I lost a week. It's just like got sucked away. Well, how was it? Did you get wet? <laughs> yeah? It went well? Good. Well, congratulations, ladies. That's a, that's a uh, wonderful, wonderful time. And you, uh, you, you take that very, very seriously. That's a step of obedience. And when you've obeyed God, then he's about to tell you something else. I found a lot of times. You listen to the Lord, you be... Uh, close fellowship with him, and it'll be an, this will be a, quite a year in your lives. And uh, what an encouragement that you followed in that important important step for a believer. Okay, Second Timothy, and chapter one, verse fourteen. Paul said to Timothy, "That good thing which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. This thou knowest that all they which are in Asia, be turned away from me, of whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes and." The Lord give mercy <clears throat> unto the house of Onesiphorus, for he oft refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. But when he was in Rome, he sought me out very diligently and found me. The Lord grant unto him that he may find mercy of the Lord in that day. And in how many things he ministered unto me at Ephesus, thou knowest very well. And then go to chapter uh, 4 of 2 Timothy. And I just wanted to... 
uh, look at verse verse 19. Salute Prissa and Aquila. That would be another place is Priscilla. Prissa and Aquila in the household of Onesiphorus. So salute Prissa and Priscilla and, and uh, Aquila in the household of Onesiphorus. Now now let's let's ask the Lord to give us some insight into the Scripture. It's a good application from it. God, we do need your help tonight. We want your Holy Spirit to teach us the things that are profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and instruction in righteousness. And I pray that you would help us as believers to be thinkers, individuals who weigh and consider truth and then seek out ways that we can apply and live the same truth that we have come to the knowledge of. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, last week we really looked at, uh, specifically, Paul his three references in chapter 1, his three mentions of the gift that was in Timothy, and specifically his call. Paul, of course, mentioned his own call to be an apostle and stressed the importance of that, emphasized it again in uh, verse 11. We talked about how that he was appointed a preacher and an apostle uh, to, and a teacher of the Gentiles and the importance of his specific call. He stressed the importance in verse 6 to Timothy not to neglect, or to, to, that he stirs up the gift of God which is in him by putting on of hands. He said, you know, when we laid hands on you, that was that signified something. There is, uh, there is a call. There is, there is, a, there is a burning in you. There is something in you uh, that is special. It's a speaking of the ordination of laying on of hands of Timothy, and then in verse fourteen, that good thing which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. And, of course, there are a lot of exhortations. As a matter of fact, 2 Timothy is just full of terse, sometimes standalone, sometimes related commands that are, this is what is important in the church. Now, Timothy is ministering and serving in the church in Ephesus. He's, uh, he is taking care of the flock there. And there are a lot of references. For instance, when Paul talks about Anesiphorus, Anesiphorus would have been uh, from... Ephesus as well. So a lot of references back to Ephesus. Uh, Sometimes, just for your own interest, study the church at Ephesus. The, the Bible just has a lot to say in particular about that particular church. This morning as we were preaching in the Revelation, it was fascinating to see how that the first church in Asia that was addressed by the Holy Spirit, by Jesus Himself, was the church at Ephesus. You remember in uh, is it chapter 20? Uh, of Acts, how before Paul, while he was on his way back to Jerusalem, he didn't want to stop at Ephesus because he was trying to make it to Jerusalem by Pentecost. And so he, from Miletus, sent to Ephesus and had the, the elders at Ephesus come and meet him at Miletus. And when they met him at Miletus, those elders at Ephesus, Paul warned them, warned them about false teachers. He said, take heed to yourselves and the flock. So there's going to be ravenous wolves, grievous wolves. They're going to be creeping in. And then he warned them about themselves. And some of you, they're going to, the, the false teachers are going to come from among you. He's not talking about over there at the church. He's talking about the group of elders, the, the ones who are responsible for taking care of the flock. And then the encouraging uh, side note that we saw this morning was that one of the things that was the commendation to the church at Ephesus by the Lord Jesus Himself was that they had tried those who have said they were apostles and were not, and were found liars, and that they had been faithful to the truth. And so, one of the things we know about the church at Ephesus is that when they were given commands by individuals like the Apostle Paul, they listened. And here this warning, this stern warning that you might be the false teachers, turns out that if there were false teachers among them, they, they sorted it out, and they cleaned house, they did business. And so this these folks at Ephesus, there are a lot of things that are that can be said about them. We know that it was a place of great persecution for the Apostle Paul, and it was a place where he was uh, run out of town. He was wildly unpopular because of contending with the Jews, as well as the Gentiles, for salvation. And so now, Timothy is an individual that is really, uh, uh, we, we could use the word protege, but he would be uh, really a, di a, a disciple or uh, an individual who's trained specifically by Paul. Paul refers to Timothy as his son in the faith. And so he would be an individual that Paul really would put in a place and say, okay, you know, pastor this church, take care of this flock, and give, give role and responsibility. 
And he was also an individual that because of their father-son relationship, Paul had no qualms about just giving direct orders to do this. Now, Paul had the authority to do so as an apostle. Okay, now, that's all well and good and fascinating, but it brings us into our context this evening. I just want to look at uh, a simple truth, one negative and one positive, uh, or, or I, I guess the aspects of which are negative and are positive. In verse 15, the apostle Paul said, This thou knowest, that all they which are in Asia be turned away from me. So, when I think all they which are in Asia, I think of the seven churches that we know about in Asia as well as others. But Paul said, Timothy, you know this as well as I do, that all of the believers in Asia have turned against me. Now, you and I don't often think of Paul's unpopularity, do we? It, it's, it, it arises over and over again. He was known as the chief of the apostles. He knew himself as the chief of sinners. But the other apostles recognized Paul's calling and his authority as an apostle. And, you know, we ask the trick question sometimes uh, about the New Testament. Who wrote the most of the New Testament? You guys know the answer to that, don't you? Who? No, not Paul. Who here? No, Luke. Luke did. Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke, and he wrote Acts. Well, most of Acts was about Paul. Chapter 9, when Paul comes on the scene, you know, from 9 all the way into, uh, until the end of, of Acts, really is about Paul and the ministry that God has for Paul. So though Paul would have been the second most prolific writer of the New Testament, uh, he actually would have been in Luke's writing the subject of most of the writing. In other words, what Paul did in establishing the church, Paul would have been uh, the guy that was written about for, for the most. I mean, Luke wrote about Jesus and he wrote about Paul. Pretty much. I mean, in the Gospel of Luke, he wrote about Jesus. In Acts, he wrote about everything until Paul came on the scene. And then he pretty much wrote about Paul. And uh, obviously there are other things that are included. But if you'll think about it from that perspective, doesn't it seem a little bit uh, of a contradiction that Paul was wildly unpopular? All the churches in Asia don't like me. They've all turned against me. You read Philippians. In chapter 1, you'll see that individuals, when Paul was in prison, were preaching Christ out of envy and strife. They were actually, uh, he said, supposing to add affliction to my bonds. So literally, when they ministered, they were kind of competing with Paul. In other words, they're trying to grow a ministry to kind of make sure that Paul and his ministry is put down. That doesn't seem Christ-like, does it? Uh, how, how many of you have ever read Romans and just been thrilled by the truth of it? doctrinally. Remember what Peter said about, about Paul's writing, not just Romans, but I think specifically he would have been referring to a lot of the doctrine in Romans, Galatians, and Colossians. He said in 2 Peter, he said, which our beloved Paul, he talked about people that are unlearned and unstable, they do rest with the Scriptures, and they, uh, they err, they don't know the power of God. He said, they're unlearned and they're unstable, and he talked about the things that our beloved brother Paul have written. He said things that are hard to be understood. Uh, and Peter here is not saying Paul writes things and makes them mysterious and difficult, but he wrote deep things. And individuals that were immature spiritually really struggled with Paul. Let's take a vote tonight. Uh, if there's going to be the anti-Paul team and the for Paul team, let's just, let's just pick sides, okay? Anti-Paul team, raise your hand. Joel, <laughs> thank you, Joel. We always got to have the goat team, right? Somebody stand up for the goats. All right, all right, Paul team. I'm going to stick with Paul because he was legitimately called by God to be an apostle, and that's good enough for me, right? But you know, <laughs> tonight we're saying, oh, we're all Paul people. Do you know that statistically speaking, most people, according to Paul, were against him, and a few were with him? Isn't that astonishing? Does that surprise you? Yes. Yeah, there's a whole anti-Paul on YouTube thing. They just, they call them You're exactly right. Yeah. Or, I think they call them Paulines or something like that. There's the Pauline theologians, the Petrine theologians, the Peter guys. The Paul, they, they exactly what Paul uh, said you're not supposed to do in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. But exactly. You know, I, listen, you can go to seminary, and not, not every seminary, and you shouldn't go to seminary that does this, but you can go to seminary and there are people, they refer to theology as Pauline, Petrine, Johannine, 
you know, John, you know, the gospel according to John, the gospel according to Paul, and the gospel according to Peter, as though it's a different gospel? No, it's Jesus. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Paul specifically contradicted that. We've, we've actually pretty extensively covered that on Wednesday evenings as we've been studying in 1 Corinthians in the last uh, month or two. And so, but I just think it's worth our observation and really reckoning with or just, just coming to, uh, coming to, you know, the, what's, what do they call it when you, when, you, the rea- when you come to the reality, get a reality check about something. Um, coming to terms, that's what I was looking for. Just coming to terms with the reality that Paul was not popular at this stage in his ministry. <laughs> How many times was Paul warned not to go to Jerusalem? In Ephesians chapter 20, he said, every place I've stopped, they've told me what's going to happen when I go to Jerusalem. Can you, can you hear the, the uh, muttering in the back gossip? And you know, Paul, he's just so stupid thinking knuckleheaded, he's a hard head. He's over in Jerusalem, he's costing everybody. You know, he keeps he tells he tells send my cloak from Troas and the parchments and send this person. He wants you know, did you, did you hear what he told? Did you hear what he told Philemon? He wanted Philemon's slave to stay there and serve him. Actually, you want you talk about the gall of the man. Why is he in prison? Why does he need somebody to bring him all this stuff and support him while he's in prison? Why is he in this position? Did anyone warn him? Did anyone say, Paul, don't go to Jerusalem? How popular has Paul been with the Jews? And he goes and shaves his head and takes a vow and goes to Jerusalem. And what do you think is going to happen? He knew what was going to happen. He doesn't listen to anybody but himself. He expects everyone to listen to him. He doesn't listen to anybody. Paul, can you hear it? mutter, the talking, the conversation. When Paul was called to be an apostle, one of the things that was said about him by the Holy Spirit was that he was going to preach the gospel in palaces and in Rome. He's going to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. He's going to preach the gospel to kings. He did all that on the way to Rome. And that's the way that God had for him to go to Rome. In uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul alludes to the reality that he is, in many ways, is a laughing stock because of the way that he's been called to be persecuted, to suffer, to do without. While the church of Corinth was, you know, they legitimately were allowed by God to live with ease and comfort. And so here we all are on Paul's team tonight, except for Brother Joel. Uh, and uh, <laughs> we're, we're all on Paul's team, and we're all saying, you know, I'd be a Paul guy, I'd stand with him through thick and thin to the end. Uh, you know, Paul didn't act, in our mind, he didn't act with a lot of wisdom. Now, I'm not telling you Paul acted in a way that wasn't led of the Holy Spirit. I'm telling you Paul, by our way of thinking, did some dunderheaded things. You know, why go to jail? If you know they're going to lock you up, why go there? Well, because God wanted him to, that's why. But as far as human reasoning goes... You have Paul say so. What else do you have? And so, folks, Paul's standing alone. I stand with Paul. Right? I stay, Paul stands with Jesus. I stand with Paul. Paul is not in prison. He's not in bonds because of sin. He's not in prison because of anything he's done wrong. He's imprisoned for the gospel for preaching the gospel. And when we read the New Testament, the Scriptures, we classify letters that Paul wrote as prison epistles. We don't even think twice about it. We just think, well, he had to go to prison. He had no choice. But you know, in his day, it wasn't viewed that way by his contemporaries. You say, Pastor, why mention this? Well, it's in the Scripture, actually, isn't it? Paul here mentioning his unpopularity. And I believe that there is... Uh, truth that we can learn and glean from it by way of application. Paul mentions a stark contrast between the way that generally he was treated by the folks in the church and in the region where Timothy is serving. Now, obviously, Timothy's a Paul guy, isn't he? He hasn't forsaken Paul. But 
He said in verse 15, the son know us, that all they which are in Asia, where's Ephesus? Asia. It's in Asia. All they which are in Asia, so he said, Timothy, you know everybody in Asia, be turned away from me. Now, there's a difference between being turned away and being turned against. You understand the difference, don't you? It's sort of like that uh, silent uh, majority. You know, there's still a silent majority in the United States of America. There are a silent majority of individuals that don't agree with the wickedness that has become politically uh, the only acceptable discourse. Only acceptable discourse. There's a silent majority that disagrees. That we're one generation from our children being taught uh, to contradict that. And we're, we're one generation from being uh, the silent minority. But we're still a majority of people that believe things that the Bible teaches. Moral issues, for instance. Somebody stands up for something morally, it's not very popular. Homosexuality is a sin. And a person who is in a perverted relationship is going to be judged by God. And I'll lose half my youth group for saying that. I mean, I, when I say that, I watch the kids feel like, like this. Like, did he just say that? You know why? Because they go to public schools where you're taught that saying something like, wickedness is sin, sin is sin, he is unacceptable, and so they, they like me, but they think I'm a bigot and living in the dark ages, and backward, and, 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 and. You know something? When I was a kid, if you said homosexuality is normal, natural, and healthy, like they started to in the late 1980s, people laughed you to derision. Because they knew it was the most ridiculous thing ever. And actually, anyone who counsels or helps people that are entrapped in the sinful lifestyle knows that those poor individuals are being destroyed by their sin in every way imaginable. That's the truth. How would you like it if I paid to put that into print in the Sun Sentinel this week? What if I felt lead? What? They, would run it. they may not run it. What if, what if I ran it? What if I bought a newspaper and ran it? Well, of course, I'm not talking about them. What I'm talking about is you. Because you're going to have to walk through the lines of the people that are standing on our sidewalk, cursing and screaming and picketing and threatening to get into this church house. You might be out of town next week not be able to come. That's sort of the situation for Paul. Remember what happened with Diana? Remember what happened at Ephesus? What happened at Ephesus? You remember? Remember, great is Diana of the Ephesians. Great is Diana. Where'd that come from? What happened at Ephesus? Paul preached that idols were dumb, inanimate objects that cannot save and that God alone can save. And the coppersmiths and the silversmiths and the goldsmiths who made idols said, this is really bad for business. And they raised up rabble-rousers and started a protest. And That's why Paul wasn't popular at Ephesus with unbelievers. And Paul was not popular at Ephesus with believers because he was unpopular with unbelievers. Do you hear me tonight? Paul was unpopular with the believers at Ephesus because he was unpopular with the unbelievers in Ephesus. And it is a fact of human nature that born-again, blood-bought believers had rather not go against the flow of people who hate the Lord Jesus than to stand with someone where there would be shame and reproach. 
All they of Ephesus are turned against me. Paul would think it would be better if you left town. You didn't come back here, ever. How did the church in Ephesus come into being? The Holy Spirit used the Apostle Paul and his team to plant the gospel there, to preach it, to plant that church. There are two guys that we know about, well, and then Aquila and uh, Priscilla, that are pro-Paul guys still. An entire city of believers. But when Onesiphorus came to Rome, when Onesiphorus came to Rome, he went looking for Paul. Where's Paul jailed? This isn't the same. This is only, this is only uh, an illustration. And it's the only thing that I can give you that, that I've personally experienced that I've related to. The week after the shooting at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas last year, um, I explored the possibility of trying to meet with Nicholas Cruz and just seeing if he'd ever heard the gospel. I just thought, you know what? This kid is a product of his environment in, in more ways than one. You know, I, I'm not for making the, the criminal the victim, but the boy was betrayed many many ways again and again and again and again if you look at his life and you look at the way he was handled I don't anyway I don't want to go into the commentary my point is the kid if he doesn't know Jesus he's going to burn in hell for eternity and so I tried to figure out if there's a way that I could um, arrange a meeting with him the problem that I ran into was that there were just too many barriers uh, there are just too many people that were trying to contact him. There's no way of getting a message to him. And then I heard that a pastor did go and speak with him. I hope that, uh, that he shared the gospel with him. And I hope that the kids heard the gospel I, or that the uh, Lord will give me the opportunity sometime. One of the things that I really had to consider when I felt led by the Holy Spirit to reach out and try to get a hold of that kid was the ramifications if anybody heard about it. You know, what, what are people going to say or think? You know, that I'm burdened about the soul of a person who's probably going to get the death penalty if he gets what he deserves. And I have it on occasion stood for things where, you know, it's one of those somebody pushes you and says somebody ought to say something kind of thing. This is my wife. She just says, somebody ought to stand up. Somebody ought to say something. You know? <laughs> Not really. But uh, <laughs> I like to tease her. Uh, I've stood for things before knowing that I've been in a discussion full of men who have said the very things that I'm saying, that I'm vocalizing. And I look around and none of those men are anywhere around. So when you theorize about truth and you look at what ought to be said or what ought to be done or what ought to be stood for, we're all on the same page. But when it comes down to the rubber meeting the road, believers are more likely to align themselves with unbelievers. if there's unpopularity or persecution for standing for truth. And it just wasn't popular to stand with Paul. He's the most popular of the apostles today, would we agree? Yeah. Time, history has borne out <laughs> that the Holy Spirit indeed was using Paul and still is today. But there's a guy in Rome that went asking around, uh, Paul, Anybody know where Paul from Tarsus? You know where he's at? He's a that guy. He's in prison, isn't he? What do you want with a guy that's in prison? You realize that pretty much anywhere in the world he's been thrown into jail. 
And Onesiphorus said, yeah, that's the guy I'm looking for. You know where he is? And sought him out and refreshed Paul. You know, we as believers will 100% certainly have times when we have the opportunity to stand with people as a minority or to slink into the corners and disappear as cowards. Every one of us ought to just ask God, what am I made of? I want to show you something cool uh, as we conclude this evening. That's all I really want to say. Paul wasn't popular, and either people were not ashamed of his chain and refreshed him, or just turned away from him. Not turned against him, just turned away from him. And say, I don't know him. They just said, uh, I, I got to go check on something. And just, you know, they. Uh, yeah, let me get back to you on that. I, Paul, uh, I, I think, yeah, I, I got to go, go, go see about something. They just turned away. They didn't, they didn't turn against him. They just, they weren't there with him. They wouldn't stand with him, wouldn't stand for him. Verse 19 of chapter 4, Salute Prissa and Aquila. And the, what's the next word? What's the word after and the? Household. Household. Household of who? Vanessa Forrest. Now here's something neat. Courage begets courage. Courage begets courage. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes just having someone stand up and say it's wrong or it's right, isn't it? Is it or not? Just having somebody just make you say it will just kind of put you in a position where you have to identify yourself. And just being forced to stand. And I suppose that growing up in the household of Vanessa Forrest, you're at the dinner table at night time and somebody starts, one of the kids start jabbering about going to jail like Paul kind of a derisive way. And Dad says, come back with that. What did you say, sir? What did I hear you say? Let's talk about Paul. First of all, let's talk about, about our church here in Ephesus. Are you born again? How would you get to be born again? Oh yeah, they shared the gospel with you. Where did they hear the gospel? Well, I know where they heard the gospel. Paul shared the gospel with them. Do you know you'd be, good, you'd be on your way to hell right now if it wasn't for the Apostle Paul? The guy you're making fun of in your conversation, repeating slander to, about? And Daddy Onesiphorus stood with Paul, stood for Paul. Stood for right. <laughs> and you know what? I think his kids are probably ashamed not to stand too, but it was catching. Courage was catching in the Anesiphorus household. So now Paul sends a greeting, not just to Anesiphorus, but sends a greeting to his household because it isn't just Anesiphorus that stands with Paul, it's his household that stands with him as well. You know cowardice is catching. Cowardice is catching. You watch a guy slip out of a group and slink off and they'll all do it need to see somebody about something. I'll be back sometime. And off he goes. And then off the next guy goes. And off the next guy goes. Off the next guy goes. Every mob is led by a courageous leader. You take out the leader, you take out the mob. Anybody who's ever watched a Western cowboy show knows that. But it's really true, isn't it? Cowardice is catching but courage is also contagious. We are in an age of opportunity. We really are. The power of God's Holy Spirit to save is not diminished. Did you hear the testimonies tonight of individuals? Most of us come from, just as families, we come from the least likely families in the world. 
to ever come to Jesus. I mean, we're just the, the, we're the motley group of individuals that shouldn't be here for the most part. Most of us, we don't have heritage. But the Holy Spirit of God reached us. And His power is not diminished to reach others. We need some people that have courage to rise up, to stand up. To speak truth for what it is, to challenge error for what it is. And to lead people and just say, you know something, right's right, I don't care how many, you can have a whole crowd, if the whole crowd's wrong, the whole crowd's wrong. This is, these are the facts, this is the truth, you have a brain, use it. And to challenge error. It'll make a difference. You know something? It might just make the difference in a guy like Paul who's in prison who's really discouraged by how many people have turned against him, but he's refreshed by one guy that seeks him out and is not ashamed of his chain. You know, that'd be worth it, wouldn't it? If I've got to pick a guy, some nondescript, unknown fellow who's never mentioned anywhere else in the Scripture other than in this letter to Timothy, if I've got to pick a guy that I want to... Just to be said about me, what was said about him, I'll be Onesiphorus. That's a man. And what a household he raised. By simply having courage, which became contagious. Father, thank you for what we've learned tonight. I pray that you would help us to catch it. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed. <laughs>